why were we put here? I think everyone wants to know, why were we put here? Why are we on earth? My purpose in life is to, uh, to live a normal life, to, to be uh, a citizen, a productive citizen. Intentar pasar por la vida de la manera más desapercibida posible. I don't fully know why I'm here, but I enjoy that. I enjoy knowing that because then that creates endless possibilities for myself. I would like to make a difference, even if it's only in one life, I'd prefer to do more. Because I think the meaning of life, in my opinion, is to find something that you're passionate about and use that passion to make the world around you a better place. Well, a number of years ago, uh, I went to a uh, seventh grade girls basketball game in a local middle school. I was youth pastor at the time, and I knew a couple of the girls playing in the game, so I went to the game, sat with one of the families there in the stands. And it was a pretty typical seventh grade girls game, kind of chaotic. The girls played with uh, lots of energy and enthusiasm. There was a lot of cheering and encouragement from the bleachers, maybe a little yelling at referees by dads, but it was fun. Then at one point in the game, uh, two girls got uh, caught wrestling for the ball at the same time, and the referee called a jump ball, you know, where they put the two girls in the middle of the floor, line up all the other girls around them, they toss it up, and there's kind of a free-for-all for the ball. You know what I'm talking about. And the girl that finally got a hold of the ball took off lickety-split for the basket, only she took off the wrong, dire wrong direction, going toward the wrong goal. And what was interesting was her teammates... Rather than correct her and say, no, go this way, go this way, they all started going with her because she was going that way. And the other team started going the other way. And the referees couldn't say anything. The parents all start yelling, no, no, go the other way. And then, but both teams just were playing just as hard, both teams, all 10 girls going the wrong direction. And it continued that way for two or three minutes of clock time. No stoppage of play, no other fouls. They were just going one direction, going the other. And what made it really funny, when there was finally a stoppage of play, a foul or something, and the girls realized they had been going the wrong direction. First of all, they all started to laugh because they were embarrassed. And then we all realized that during that entire time, no one had managed to score a basket. So they had played like crazy, going the wrong way, trying to score baskets that nobody had scored and they were going the wrong way. Anyway, so here's a question for you. Were the girls actually playing basketball? <laughs> now, obviously, the answer is yes. But if so, um, why was everyone so concerned? Why were all the parents yelling? Well, you say, well, that's obvious. They were going the wrong way. Well, that's true, and that's part of it, but there was something a little deeper going on. After all, they were still getting good exercise. They were still having fun. They were still, still uh, having teamwork. They were still playing the game. But the real issue had to do with, with purpose, because the purpose of the game is to win the game by scoring more points than the other team. And if you're going the wrong direction, you have no chance to score points for your team. And without that goal in mind... When there is no purpose, the game made no sense. Now today, as you saw in the video, we're starting a new series of messages called Explore God. So today, in the next six weeks, we're going to try to address some of the most significant and, quite honestly, difficult questions that many of us, maybe almost all of us, have about, about faith. Uh, we are going to uh, do a kind of a general introduction to these questions. They're all uh, much deeper than we can cover in one message, and our volume is written about each. And I would assume today, a bit of a generalization, but I would assume that there are um, three kinds of people here today. There are those of you who would regard yourself as being very, very committed, strongly committed to your faith, sure of what you believe and why you believe. And this series will maybe reinforce that and push you a little deeper uh, in understanding. There are those of us who are somewhat committed to our faith. That is, we, we're here and we believe, but we really haven't thought a whole lot about why. And if we were pushed, we would struggle to answer any of these questions, at least not from a biblical perspective. And thirdly, there are those of us here today who are curious and interested, but not sure at all about what we actually believe when it comes right down to it. And we're glad 
that all of you are here. Many of you are also involved in what we call Explore God discussion groups, meeting in homes or coffee shops. I think one's meeting here today where uh, the discussion is getting started. And we're starting conversations in those groups. And here, weekend by weekend in our services, Pastor Jeff, uh, Pastor Sterling, and I will be taking on and trying to address these issues from a Christian perspective, from a biblical perspective. So today our question is, does life have a purpose? Does life have a purpose? I want to begin by reading from one of the oldest and actually one of the least read parts of the Bible. In the Old Testament, the book is called Ecclesiastes. Now that's kind of a strange word, but it just uh, is a word that comes from a Greek word that means one who addresses an assembly, kind of like what I'm doing here today. And this ancient book begins in chapter 1 with these words. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What the people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun. Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. Verse 8, all things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. In verse 11, no one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. Okay, these words were written some 2,500 years ago, but sound strikingly contemporary to our ears today. The ancient writer says, generations come and generations go. People live and people die, and nothing really changes. So what's the point? What's the point? I want to begin today with the human condition. And that's point one, if you're following along, the human condition. In ancient Greek mythology, there is a character named Sisyphus. Anybody ever hear of Sisyphus? Study it in school. Maybe we're supposed to study it in school. Uh, but Sisyphus was an arrogant and cruel king. Again, he's a mythological character in Greek literature. But an, an arrogant and cruel king who is punished by the gods by being forced to spend his life pushing a boulder up a hill, only have it roll back down again, over and over again, up and down. Sisyphus is condemned to an eternity of useless effort and endless frustration, kind of like the bears. <laughs> Moment of silence. In the mid-20th century, a French philosopher named Albert Camus wrote a book entitled The Myth of Sisyphus, in which he outlined and became famous for what is known as existential philosophy. Camus argued, and many others with him, that human life is fundamentally absurd because God does not exist, and therefore human life has no ultimate eternal meaning, that we were each left like Sisyphus to live our lives as if we're pushing a rock up a hill only to have it roll back down again over and over again while we just wait for our deaths. That somehow we are to create meaning on our own from a meaningless existence. Now, in his own way, of course, Camus has echoed the words of the ancient writer of Ecclesiastes, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. But here's the thing. Philosophers might tell us that human life is ultimately meaningless, but we don't want it to be meaningless, do we? We find it frustrating when girls are playing basketball going the wrong way. We find it maddening to look at a picture of a man pushing a rock up a hill, only have it roll back down again. And that tells us something about ourselves, that we as human beings crave meaning. We need purpose in order to live. It's just part of what it means to be human. Let me give you a little example. One of the worst jobs I ever had in my life was a long, long time ago, um, and it involved hand stamping a whole stack of what were essentially were little sales receipts for a small business. Uh, so the boss said he was going to pay me a penny a stamp. I had this little hand stamper, and it, it rotated, so the numbers changed each time, and I was to stamp the top of these receipts and put them on a, a pile, stamp, pile, stamp, pile, stamp, pile, a penny, a receipt. 
I needed the money. So I did that for two days. I stamped a little over 20,000 invoices in two days. It was relentlessly, mind-numbingly boring. Eight hours a day, jump, 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 jump. But at least I had a purpose. I needed the money. I made $200 in two days. But what if instead of $200, the boss had told me at the end of these two days, I'm going to pay you $2 million. Now that would have been purpose, right? I had a little purpose before. I could have had a fantastic purpose. In fact, that would have changed the entire experience. Time would have flown by. Those two days would have been filled with purpose and meaning and hope and joy, right? The experience would have been completely different because that's how we're wired up. That's how we're made. A German philosopher named Martin Heidegger writes that humans are the only living beings who wonder about the meaning of their lives. As human beings, we think, live, and act as if our lives have purpose, even when philosophers and culture tells us there is no ultimate purpose to human life. Why? Perhaps the best way to understand this is to say we are somehow hardwired for purpose and meaning. Another way to say it is that every human being lives for something. It might be family, it might be work, it might be money, it might be retirement, it might be adventure, it might be God, it might be the Chicago Bears. I saw a story this week about a guy who has been to every Bears home game for 33 years. We all live for something because we are hardwired for purpose. And that leads us to the second point I want to talk about, and that is the human dilemma. That's the human condition. Here's the human dilemma. Now, I'm not a big tool guy, and I've said that before, but I do have a few tools. In fact, I have three hammers. I don't know why I have three hammers. You can really only use one hammer at a time, right? I think I have three hammers because somewhere throughout the years, I'll, I need a hammer, and I can't find my hammer, so I go buy a new hammer. And then I have two. And then the next time I have, I can have something to do, I can't find either hammer, so I go buy another hammer, so now I have three hammers. So I have three hammers. Um, if, I, if I were to ask you what's the purpose of a hammer... You would say, well, to drive in nails or to hit something really hard, right? And hammers are good for that. I brought this handy prop with me today. Hammers are really good at hitting things hard. What you would not say, I would guess, is that hammers are good for polishing silverware or maybe cutting a nice piece of apple pie. I actually brought one here today with me. Right? It's a, it's a beautiful apple pie. I've never tried this before, but if I tried to cut it, <laughs> uh, that didn't go so well. Actually, um, it occurs to me that it actually ruined the purpose of the apple pie as well. <laughs> but, if, but you would say, if I asked you, how do you know the purpose of a hammer, you would say something like, well, that's why it was made. That was what, in the, in the mind of whoever created the hammer in the first place, they had in mind hitting things hard, not cutting an apple pie. In other words, the hammer's purpose comes from the hammer's creator. So when it comes to the purpose of human life, we essentially have two options. In his recent book, a uh, very good book, by the way, called Making Sense of God, Tim Keller identifies these two options as what he calls first created meaning or purpose. That is meaning that you generate from within yourself or that is created by the culture around you. It's generated in human beings for their own lives. Secondly, there is discovered meaning or purpose, which is meaning that is received from somewhere outside of yourself, outside of the realm of human culture. Let me talk first about created meaning or purpose. In Ecclesiastes, the ancient writer describes his own effort to create meaning in his life. Ecclesiastes 1, verse 16. I said to myself... Look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom, also to, of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. So he tries to create meaning by pursuing 
wisdom and knowledge and information and finds it to be like chasing the wind. Then he applies himself to pleasure and accomplishment. Next chapter, chapter 2. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all my hands had done, and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Again, words that sound very contemporary to us. This ancient man finds that all his efforts to create meaning instead lead to a deep personal sense of meaninglessness. Now I want to start there because created meaning or purpose is the default mode of our modern secular culture. Now here's how it goes. The material universe is all there is, and everything can be explained by what we call science. And by the way, this is what's taught in every major university in America. The material universe is all there is, and everything can be explained by science. There is no God, no creator who is all-powerful, all-loving, and personal. Everything that exists from the galaxies of the heavens to your pet Labrador retriever is the product of random forces in the universe. Human beings are also the product of these same random forces called evolution over billions of years. And therefore, there is no ultimate purpose to human life other than the survival of the species. Again, this is taught in every major university in America. So the only purpose or meaning that we experience, we must create on our own because we're just Sisyphus pushing the rock up and down the hill. Now, most people would not say it that way. Rather, they say it like this. They say things like, I believe I'm responsible for my own fate. Or, I believe my purpose in life is to be true to myself. Or, I believe your life is whatever you make it. I came across a blog site just this week. The author wrote, and listen carefully, I don't believe we have to experience a life-altering event to deepen the meaning of our lives. But I do believe everyone benefits when we act in alignment with our own personal soul map and quit looking outside for what our life should look like. Then this writer gives five things to give more meaning to life. Here they are. Be a better listener. Stop comparing yourself to others. Connect to your own inner wisdom. Do something that makes your soul sing and let go of guilt. Now, these are all fine and very good things, but they're all examples of what I'm calling created meaning today. Now, created meaning is powerful and can lead to many, many wonderful things in life. The problem is that created meaning is both arbitrary and very fragile. Let me try to demonstrate. For example, the blogger said, connect to your own inner wisdom. That sounds good. We hear it all the time in our culture, but how do you know that your own inner wisdom is actually wisdom and not foolishness? How do you know that your own inner wisdom doesn't completely collide to someone else's inner wisdom? Or do something that makes your soul sing. Sounds great. I love it when my soul sings. But how do you know you even have a soul? How do you know it's not your imagination? How do you know that what makes your soul sing will make another person's soul scream out in agony? How do you know? Or, what if I decide my ultimate purpose in life is to care for the sick? And I study for umpteen years to become a doctor. And I do that to the best of my ability, and yet still people suffer and die. What happens to my purpose? Or maybe my purpose is to, I don't know, win the Super Bowl. And then my kicker. Misses the field goal. Sorry about that. What happens to my purpose then? Then, of course, beyond all this, there is the, the inevitability of death itself. I did a funeral right in this room yesterday. I have a graveside service with another family tomorrow. And let me tell you something, and you all know this. When you stand with a grieving family in a cemetery next to an open grave, not only is everyone there thinking about the purpose of life, everyone is longing, aching for life to have an ultimate purpose in that moment. Everyone. Thomas Nagel, professor of philosophy at New York University, who is not a Christian, writes, 
Even if you produce a great work of literature which continues to be read thousands of years from now, eventually the solar system will cool or the universe will wind down and collapse and all trace of your effort will vanish. The problem is that although there are justifications for most things big and small that we do within life, none of these explanations explain the point of your life as a whole. It wouldn't matter if you never existed. And after you've gone out of existence, it won't matter that you did exist. So, modern culture has a crisis of purpose. Human beings universally crave purpose and meaning, and yet we are told over and over again that there is no ultimate purpose other than whatever we can manage to create for ourselves during the short time of our existence on this planet. I can't help but wonder that maybe, just maybe, that might help explain why that even though we live now in one of the most advanced, affluent, and comfortable societies that's ever inhabited the face of the earth, we are also collectively among the most depressed, medicated, and conflicted people that have ever lived. Maybe. But there is, however, a second way. The second way I mentioned is discovered meaning or purpose. The Christian faith claims that like the hammer, human beings were created with a purpose in mind, that our purpose has been determined by our creator. In the New Testament, Jesus actually speaks to this purpose in Matthew chapter 22. It says, one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, addressing Jesus, which is the greatest commandment in the law? What's the most important thing in life, Jesus? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus is saying here, among other things, that human beings are created for two purposes. To know and love God. Next week we ask the question, is there a God? Does God exist? And secondly, to love our neighbors as ourselves. Jesus is teaching that we cannot create our own purpose by looking into ourselves. We don't have to do that. Rather, we discover our purpose by looking to our creator. And here's why that matters. If there is such a thing as discovered meaning, if there is a purpose for life that comes from the God who created us, then it's infinitely more permanent and infinitely more trustworthy than anything we can create for ourselves. If my purpose comes from God is to, and is to love and know him and to love my neighbor as myself, then I can care for the sick and if and when they die, and they will, my purpose remains intact. I can miss the field goal, lose the game, but my purpose is entirely intact. See, the great story arc of the Bible is that God created all that is and created human beings to know and love him and to love each other. However, human beings discarded that purpose, disregarded their creator, failed to love their neighbors as themselves, and have since gone to great lengths to create, try to create their own meaning and purpose in life. Christian philosopher C.S. Lewis says it this way. He says, all that we call human history, money, poverty, ambition, war, prostitution, classes, empires, slavery, is the long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. The Christian faith teaches that we don't have to guess at our purpose. We don't have to create it ourselves. And yet our lives do have purpose, can have purpose. In fact, more than that, can have eternal purpose. Which leads us to the third point today, the divine design. The divine design. Many of you know that most of what we call the New Testament was written by one man, the Apostle Paul, or St. Paul, if you please. A man who had the purpose of his life challenged to the core, had the very trajectory of his life radically altered through a personal encounter with Jesus of Nazareth. Now I want you to listen to the following paragraph that comes from a personal letter he wrote to the Philippians. Uh, listen to it from the standpoint of purpose. Philippians chapter 3. Paul writes, I want to know Christ. 
Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not, o- not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now Paul's words there drip with purpose. He says, I want to know Christ and to take hold of that for which he's taken hold of me. In other words, his purpose for me. Now what does that mean? Now Paul believed that Jesus was the incarnation of God. We're going to ask the question, is Jesus God a few, in a few weeks? Paul believed that Jesus is the one by whom all things were created. He believes Jesus is the one to whom all things will return. He believes Jesus is the one who came into this world to reveal the redemptive plan of God for the entire universe. So the first and greatest purpose of his life is to know Christ. That's what he says. I want to know Christ. Christ. And in knowing Christ, Paul experiences what we call the gospel. That is, in knowing Christ, Paul receives a new heart, which means he's forgiven for his sin. And in Paul's case, his sins were pride, hatred, and violence. And notice, the Christian gospel does not teach you must forgive yourself. It teaches forgiveness is only received as a gift. Paul received a new identity. He no longer identified himself with his culture, his religion, his education, his accomplishments, or his failures. He found his identity in Christ who loved him. And then he also received a new purpose. Paul no longer lived for his own fame, his own ambition, his own glory, but he lived to know Christ and to love others by making him known to them. And finally... Tucked away in this passage, Paul received a new destiny. A new destiny. Notice he says, I press on toward the goal, the purpose, to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul's ultimate purpose is to live heavenward. What does that mean? It means for a Christian, death is not the end of life. Now, if that's not an oxymoron, I don't know what is. For a Christian, death is not the end of life. Rather, it's the beginning of the eternal life for which we were all originally created by our Creator. It means we can live life with a purpose discovered in our Creator and for a reward that extends after death itself. It means to live this life as if eternity matters. Uh, Years ago, some 30 years ago now, I led a small group of high school students from this church on a mission trip to rural Mexico. Some of you have heard me tell this story in the past. It's the best one I can think of to illustrate. We served for a week or so in an agricultural project uh, to benefit a local community, um, some of the poorest people in the Western Hemisphere. So it was a a farm to raise uh, corn and beans. Another group was there at the same time we were there, a group of young adults, 20-somethings, from a church in Colorado. And their leader was a great guy whose name was Kent. And on Kent's team of five or six 20-somethings, there was a a young man named Randy. Randy was about 25 years old, and Randy suffered from some version of cerebral palsy. Uh, He was bright, had a great outgoing personality, but he struggled physically. Uh, He struggled to walk, for example. Legs were, were, were twisted out of shape, and he used arm crutches, and he dragged himself, literally dragged his legs around with him as he walked with crutches. And the farm a project was very challenging for him because it was, the, the, the pathways were rutted, and it was dangerous for him. He fell every day, multiple times. We eventually had to assign someone to stay with Randy all the time so he wouldn't hurt himself. And I find myself wondering, in the first, uh, for most of that experience, why someone like Randy would even come on a mission trip like that. Like, why Kent would allow him to come with that team? Um, Our work was digging a a series of irrigation uh, trenches in a large field. It would eventually be a field of corn and beans, and it was really, really hard physical work. 
And Randy just couldn't do that kind of work. Uh, he couldn't even make it out to the field hardly. So we just left him sitting on a patio near the barracks where he sat all day for hours putting a handful of dirt in little plastic bags with, a, with, a seed, with seeds in the bags that would eventually be planted in the field that we were digging out, out, out uh, in the fields. So he did that day after day, hour after hour. Finally, on the last day of the, next to the last day of the trip, we were all out uh, digging, and we were shocked to see Randy uh, inching his way down the path toward us. He had talked someone into carrying a chair for him, and he was dragging himself with his arm crutches out to where we were digging. We're thinking, what's Randy doing? He gets all the way out to the trench, and he announces, doesn't ask, he announces to his leader, Kent, he says, I'm tired of putting dirt in bags. I want to dig, he said. And so he, they plopped the chair down for him on the edge of this, like, four-foot-deep trench. And he said, give me a pickaxe. We handed him one of these heavy pickaxes. And Randy was really strong in his upper body, his arms, from dragging himself around. And so we all stood there watching him. And he took, sitting in a chair, he took one little swing at the dirt and pulled out just a little bit of dirt. And he wasn't very happy with that. So he swung harder the second time. This time he pulled out a whole big chunk of dirt, and he started to smile. The third swing, he swung with all his might. And he flipped himself right out of that chair, head first, into the trench, legs sticking up like that. And we all go running over, and we drag Randy out of this. We pull him up out of the trench. And Kent, his leader, is frustrated with Randy now. He goes, Randy, what are you doing? And after 30 years, I'll never forget Randy's face and what he said. Big toothy grin, dirt clod stuck to his face. He said, I'm just serving Jesus, Kent. What are you doing? It was beautiful. If you'd asked me early in that trip, why is Randy here? What's his purpose? I would have struggled, honestly, I would have struggled for an answer. I couldn't really see it why, why Randy would be on that trip. He couldn't help dig. He slowed us down. We had to watch him all the time. I would have been very wrong. Very wrong. Randy knew his life had a purpose. Randy believed that his purpose came from the God who created him. He knew that his purpose was to love that God and love his neighbor as himself. And even beyond that, Randy believed that his ultimate destiny was not in that trench in Mexico. It wasn't in his twisted up legs or his crutches. It was his goal and his destiny to dwell forever with the God who made him for himself. And so, Randy lived his life heavenward, I think. And so can we. That's how we get started. Does life have a purpose? It's a good question, and it's got a good answer. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, we all have questions. Some of the questions we have, we ask out loud. Some of them we carry secretly in our minds and hearts. Not sure if we should even ask them out loud. And thank you for not leaving us to drift aimlessly through a meaningless universe. Thank you for creating us with hungry hearts, with a longing for purpose and meaning. Help us discover our purpose in your great and eternal purpose. We pray these things in your name. Amen.